It's power time on Star Style. Be the star you are with your passion, purpose, and possibility producer, Cynthia Bryan. Now, back to the power party. This business of show business is calling out Well, the power now begins. Thank you so much for staying with me. I'm Cynthia Bryan, and you're listening to Star Style. Be the star you are. We're coming to you live on the Voice America Network. This is the Empowerment Channel, and I am so excited to welcome our guest, uh, mystery writer Gerald Everett Jones, a freelance writer from California. This is the third book in his Evan Wycliffe mystery that we'll be talking about today, Preacher Raises the Dead, and he has won several book awards. He also uh, hosts his own um, his own radio show, too, on Get Published. So, hello, Gerald. How are you? And thank you for coming to Star Style. Be the star you are. Well, I'm just peachy here on the left coast, <laughs> Cynthia, just a few blocks from the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Oh, my gosh. So you're in Santa Monica, aren't you? Yes, so, yes, yes. You know, I've, I, I have to say that I have just been dying to see the ocean this whole pandemic. I haven't. And it's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, even through the pandemic, uh, the, the the beach was pretty much open in the beginning um, a couple of years back, uh, they were trying to discourage, I don't know, volleyball and whatever, yeah, but that, that didn't, things. that didn't last very long. People still went to the beach. Right. I mean, it's hard to keep people away from the beach. Well, let's get to your book. Um, I, I, before I started, there was something that just really grabbed me because I really love the fact that you have written about a minister who kind of doubts his faith. He's rather agnostic. But you had a line in your book that just jumped out at me. And it it said, but for anyone who has ever grasped even a hint of faith, life without it is a horror. (laughs) And I thought that was such a a, a really such a superb sentence. What gave you the idea to even start this series? Well, you know, the very first book in this, this is the third book in the series, and they don't necessarily need to be read in in sequence, but the very first book in the series was Preacher Finds a Corpse. And that actually came from a, was inspired by, let's say, uh, uh, an incident in my own family. Uh, which my ancestors are from southern Missouri, uh, around Appleton City, where I've set this series. Oh, so you really know that area? Cause well, was- you know, it's it's been years and years since I've been back. And it's interesting because I, I, you know, I watch the series Ozark on Netflix and I... <laughs> Oh my. I don't, there's a lot that I don't recognize, but I, I, you know, <laughs> my, my, my family, were, they were farm people and uh, Im- Im- pretty much uh, German and Swiss immigrants um, from the uh, 19th century. Mm-hmm. And so they were homesteaders and, and they got kicked out of their houses during the Civil War and, you know, all those kinds of things. Anyhow, uh, my uncle did uh, kill himself in his early 50s and and it had to do as near as the family can tell with something of a land dispute in that area and it's if you if you're talking about old farmland you've not only got the difficulties of the fact that that was a no man's land during the civil war and agreements were handshakes between Mm -hmm. farmers but also before that you had the osage indians and (laughs) You know that the the, uh, the government said, "Well, we own all this," and then they drove everybody to Oklahoma. Right, right. Uh, so, so that was this the core mystery. Of, I I have Evan finding his best friend, his best friend's corpse in a cornfield, and, and it looks and like questioning whether it is. They say it's suicide, but questioning right, right. whether and it's it looks homicide. Very much like that, and the thing is that the the uh, the sheriff is very quick to co- close the case. You know he he he's understaffed and uh, he's got all the evidence he needs and, and but Evan is wondering okay well m- number one I don't think Bob was necessarily in the mindset to do this but number two um, who's going to benefit is, is it possible that somebody actually drove him to it now that's not necessarily mm-hmm. murder but it's certainly a sin mm-hmm. so but the other thing <laughs> that's kind of I'd say I, I don't know I'd say unique but 
Evan is at the beginning of the series something of a dropout. He he left Divinity School after he got his degree. Did not want to pursue the ministry. Uh, went into advanced physics, astrophysics at MIT. Thought he was going to get answers that way about all the big questions. Right. <laughs> Didn't get answers either place. Not in seminary, not in physics class. And then he and, started and, chasing after people who didn't pay their bills for cars, right? Well, when, Car he, when, he, when he came back to Southern Missouri, uh, there wasn't really much work to do. And of course, you know, in farmland these days, you know, the conglomerates have bought up the productive land that's there and the the market, uh, you know, the, the corn market is usually overproduced and uh, everybody's producing soybeans and, you know, it's just very competitive, very difficult to get work. So, yes, he works as a part-time guest preacher for the Baptist church and sometimes gets paid. And, and he's working as a skip tracer for the local car dealer, the local Ford dealership, um, because he's something of a data driller, you know, he, he I had never to... heard that, that, um, skip tracer. I had never heard of well, that how, as a profession. This is, this is somebody who tracks down missing persons, uh, people who have uh, skipped uh, on yeah, their obligation. A better, kind of a sleuth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, he's in, he's an amateur sleuth. That's, that's the, the beauty of this whole, you know, the engine that drives this whole series. But, the idea of a, uh, a skip tracer has actually changed quite a bit in the last uh, couple of decades because it used to be a skip tracer was kind of an amateur private eye. I mean, they're 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 professional, but you know they they would they would be knocking on doors and spying on people and you know just trying to dig up anything they could. These days, basically, you don't have to leave your desk to find just about anybody. I mean, you know, it's really all right. It's right there. It's right at the yeah, tip yeah. of and, a and, computer. And, and, you know, uh, we might all try to, uh, to preserve our privacy in whatever ways, but uh, we are much more detectable uh, simply as a, as a community and as a nation than we used to be. So um, yes, that's how he starts out. And, what happens is, and, and this is this is the genre that you would call amateur sleuth, is that people tend to come to him in this small town with their problems because people in authority and and other uh, people who might be in positions of responsibility simply don't have any interest in solving them. So, especially in the second book, uh, which is Preacher Fakes a Miracle. Evan befriends uh, a couple of uh, misfit teenagers. One is a young man who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and the other is his girlfriend who actually has epilepsy. And both of them are accused by some people in this small community as being possessed by demons. Well, Evan knows enough to know that that's not the case. He befriends them, but but you know by getting them good care by paying attention to them and and get getting them back on track he gets a reputation as a faith healer which is something right. something that he's got to live down so here going into the third book we have covid just breaking out and the milestone event that happens besides covid is that the the aging minister of the baptist church marcus thurston um, African American, um, the 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 wise man of the town, <laughs> decides it's time for him to retire. So he tells Evan, you know, you're a guest preacher. I don't know anybody else who can do this. Evan, I know you don't want this job, but you got to step up to it. So here Evan is. He's a full time minister, and one of the things he realizes is, I've got to visit the sick and the dying. I've got to host weddings and. Oh my God, funerals. And so in the very first pages of, of this book, he go, he's he been requested to visit a, 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 a woman who has been hospitalized, long-term care with, with dementia. And before he can get to her hospital room, he's advised she's had a heart attack and passed away. Yeah. And the go nurse comes the nurse, the, the charge nurse comes out, confronts him and says, and he says, I, I guess I'm too late. And she says, well, actually, you're not. <laughs> yeah. 
actually you're not she's she's just come back <laughs> and so um with, with, at the risk of you know too many spoilers the, evan gets involved and you know uh, well number one she was gone much longer than 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 after she was declared uh yeah, right. so so what's up with that i mean is, is is this physically possible and you know it did what does she have to say about it? Did did angels bear her to her rest? Did she encounter relatives? Did she see a white light? So, I mean, I'll leave the, all these as open questions, but, you know, this is Well, not... I have a question, Gerald, yes, for yes. you. First of all, what made you decide to make um, Evan a preacher? Because well, preacher's you know, the first my word. Background, you, I mean, did, my... did that just come to you or what was that? Well, they say, write what you know. I mean, I, this is my, this is my 12th novel and I've, I've written about young men chasing girls, and I, I kind of knew something about that. That was a series, right. a satire series, and I I wrote about uh, some his, a historical mystery about uh, scandal in a famous uh, artwork in the Gilded Age, and I I knew something of art history, so I, that, that's one of the reasons I wrote about that. And I wrote Mr. Ballpoint about the guy who invented the ballpoint pen because I'd actually worked for the grandson of that guy. And he told me the story over a couple of drinks. I said, this has got to be a book. That's uh, fun. But actually, I I was raised as a Southern Baptist. Uh, now, I guess you'd say, you'd either say I'm a new thought practitioner or I'm a profound I don't know us. Maybe I guess I'm, you know, like Evan. Mm -hmm. But I I was a student minister in in my teenage years briefly. Oh, I did a, so you I, truly know about this. Yeah, no, I did a lot of Bible study and, and my father was a Sunday school teacher and also then became in his later years a genealogist. So he was digging into all this family history from that part of the world. So I knew a lot about the Swiss German immigrants and and the um, and as I say, the land disputes around the Civil War and, and some of the local lore. And then of course also when I Grew up, I was I grew up in Kansas City. I wasn't a farm boy, but uh, my grandparents would take me down to the farm on weekends when my parents wanted to rest. Me and my brother, we go down, and you know we were taught to hunt, taught to fish, you know, rode on the backs of uh, horses and sheep, and uh, we're, bulls. You know, we were when we were walking down my great aunt's sidewalk, we were uh, uh, advised to avoid the duck shoe polish. <laughs> because there were there were ducks all over and ducks and chickens all over her, mm -hmm. her lawn. So I knew a lot about Appleton City, Rockville area. You know, Rockville is um, what they call a one silo town. Butler is a two, two silo town. Is there really a town called Pe Peculiar? There absolutely is. There and, is. <laughs> and I did not know. And it, it was fun setting a lot of the story in Peculiar. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did research that. I was actually, I, in the second book, I had to have Evan go up to an assisted living center. And there really is one there that I, that actually where some of my uh, relatives had been treated, uh, John Knox Village, which has changed somewhat since then, but it's in Lee's Summit. Well, if you draw a straight line between Appleton City in the south and Lee's Summit in the north, you have to pass through this town on the interstate peculiar <laughs> and that it, turns, peculiar. <laughs> it turns out that the people didn't actually want it named peculiar this was again during the 19th century the settlers but the postmaster wrote to washington dc to the postmaster general and said we need a new name for our city how about and i i think the name he wanted was excelsior something like that postmaster wrote back uh and said, Excelsior's been taken, what else? <laughs> and so the postmaster peculiar wrote back and said, anything that's really unique. <laughs> so the postmaster and peculiar. Named it peculiar. And so that worked. <laughs> that worked. Well, what about Stuart Shackleton? Is he based on any particular character? I mean, definitely a shady character. Well, he's certainly an amalgam. I mean, he's an adversary. I I suppose you would, I don't know that you can call him an evil man so much as a, as a greedy man, greedy a land man. grabber, an mm -hmm. opportunist, uh, because he's not, he's not an indecent fellow. 
although he sometimes has murderous urges i you know uh, we 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 do we do need uh, people who don't wear white hats in these books but shackleton is an investment banker and he's from the town of rich hill which is very that's close perfect. and the thing that's very interesting about rich hill is most of the wealth in which in rich hill comes from coal mining mm-hmm. the peabody coal company has pretty much dominated that area and as a result a lot of the capital that funds buying your tractor, your combine, refinancing your farm comes out of that area. So it was really irresistible to make Stu Shackleton, a, um, you know, a financier. And then also, of course, it, you know, if you're looking at what investment bankers do these days, he's working side by side with developers who, you know, okay, the, 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 the interesting that thing that's happening in that area, and the uh, the model for it, you might say, is Branson, the city of Branson, which is somewhat further south, um, not on the Lake of the Ozarks, but on another uh, another another lake. But Branson is, if if you don't know, is something of Nashville South. The Grand Ole Opry has a branch there, and there are now casinos and there are water sports. And the f- fact that the Appleton City area, where my stories are located, are very close to Truman Lake and the Lake of the Ozarks, which kind of come up against each other, they are, and they both flow into the Mississippi River. But those are both man-made lakes that the Lake of the Ozarks is well on its way to being another Branson. There are casinos there <laughs> and water sports. Uh, just like just like in on the TV series, right? Exactly. Well, yeah, and the TV series has got, um, you know, laundering laundering Mexican mob right. money. Mob and I, I, I don't have I don't have uh, Mexican bad bad actors in this. I I in the second book in the series I do have some. Um, Russian oligarchs who are mm-hmm. somewhat um, that are perhaps, all in the news right now. Well, well you yeah, do talk they're, about they're, Russia. You do talk. Uh, I mean, it, you do talk about um, Russia a little bit here in this one, um, yeah. saying, "Well, I don't want to. Never mind. I'm not going to give the. I'm not going to give that away." <laughs> if you're just joining us, we're talking to Gerald Everett Jones. He is the author of the Evan Wycliffe mystery series, and this is the third book in the series called Preacher Rages the Dead. But he's also the author of twelve other novels, all different different kinds. So we're just figuring out and discussing, you know, how he comes up with the characters and so much of it is of family history and family lore. I I did read, uh, Gerald, that when you sit down to write, this was a kind of a different experience for you in writing the series because you used to write actually more technical and business nonfiction for publishing houses. And in these books, the characters kind of come to you. Were you writing this one during the beginning of COVID, during the beginning of the pandemic, or is when did you start this one? I had started the series, let's see, the series is about four years old. And this particular book, I actually began to write it after COVID broke out. And I wasn't really sure. It, it's a it's an interesting challenge for fiction writers these days about whether you incorporate COVID in the plot. Mm-hmm. And I, I I saw some reviews the other day of other books. They were, they were calling them lockdown books because the COVID was very much at the center of the plot. Mm-hmm. And there was something of the re- some comments in the review were saying, well, who really wants to read about that? And, okay, I can understand that, but one of the things that I began to realize was that if you were writing a book, if you were living in France in the midst of World War II during the German occupation, and you didn't talk about that, I don't under, they, you'd, you'd be living on another planet. Yeah, no, I think it's important to talk about it. So it's organic to our lives. And and actually, you know, I've, I'm working on another book now. It's, it's, the next book is not in this series, but it does begin 
uh, also during COVID. And now it looks as though the plot's going to go through the, um, the Ukrainian invasion. So the question is, how much of that is, you know, by the by the by the time that book is released, whether it's this summer or in the fall, will that be a, will that war still be going on? Uh, and that that's a that's a consideration. You know that that's something for um, yeah the that has to be figured into the plot for sure. But yes, yeah, when I write the mysteries, writing fiction. Um, for yourself, because I really wanted to figure, I wanted to hear from you how the characters show up in your life, because they, it sounds like they're writing themselves, that sometimes you don't even know who's going to show up, like from book one to book two to book three. They very much are. They very much do. You know, I I put them on the stage, <laughs> and then they say what they want to say, and they go where they want to go. And I didn't always write this way. I did, um, uh, especially when I wrote business books, I wrote to outlines, strict outlines, and I had supervising editors, and I had to ask permission if I wanted to change anything. But especially uh, with these this, these later mysteries, I have tried as much as possible not to know in the beginning what's going to happen on a step-by-step -step basis. Now, I might I might have a sense of where... I want to begin what I what I want to jump into. For example, this near death experience episode. I had read about that in my research, and the the episode that I describe is fictionalized, and some of the facts are changed. But it, it's really it's it's really inspired by that episode. It by something that really happened that was really quite amazing the way it went down. And that's why I thought it was an intriguing scene, if, if you were, will. So, but, and I might know where I want the book to kind of end up, although in this one, I didn't. Um, and I like to surprise myself. I, I was just going to ask that question. Was it fun to be surprised or is it also a little scary? Because no, I, not, I, not I sure. try every way I can to be surprised and my rules are always make when I come to a any kind of dramatic decision it's always make the interesting choice try to make the unexpected choice mm, I like that that and is try to have that choice have consequences if not serious consequences because and this is one of the things actually I learned from our good friend Dan Brown, the author, I, I, I don't know him personally, but I did take his master class. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he said that was really very helpful was, uh, and, and I, you know, he has a reputation as, you know, writing page turner novels. And the, I had assumed that the way that he, that he was going to describe, oh, okay, this is how you back him into a room and you start flooding it with water and there's no way out. Be I mean, because he has writ written things like that, mm -hmm. f physical jeopardy. Right, right. And what I found was, he said, not at all what I expected. What he said was, the way, the way to write a page turner is to just keep making promises to the reader. And I thought, promises? And then he explained that, you know, at the end of a chapter, don't just tie it off like the end of a short story. Don't put that period in, the, you know, in that drama. Always make sure that there's some questions, some something. Else. And the minute you resolve a question, make sure that that resolution triggers half a dozen other questions. Because the reason that people would want to turn the page, your reader, your beloved readers want to turn that page is they want to find out what's next. And what's next? Just like you the want, cliffhanger. You want, to, you, want to, you want to intrigue them with, you know, that th this feels familiar, but I, that's never quite happened that way before. I mean, I read about something like this in the paper, but I, not like this. So what happens this time? So, and there's an old saying I used to I used to write um, educational films, and my my producer boss had a saying. He said everybody wants a new idea that stood the test of time. Mm 
<laughs> yeah, that's a good so, one. You know, Isn't that it's true? Like, it's like we're little children. Because be there are no this. new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. T- tell me a bedtime story. Well, you know, how about the three bears? Oh, I've heard that. No, you haven't heard it. <laughs> you haven't heard. Well, I haven't it. heard it this way. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so you are you're really a prolific writer. So, what is next for you as far as um, writing? Do you have something else in the works now? I hesitate to say I'm about a third of the way through the next one. In terms of page count, I am. <laughs> I don't well, but know. we know there, it, there's so much <laughs> editing. I, I have authored eight books, and I'm actually writing a children's <laughs> yes. book right now. Well, and I don't and, know where this one's turning out. I, 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 I don't know how it's turning out at all. But no, this one is called Jonathan's Journal, and it's about a shut in, uh, a, a fellow who is something of an introvert, doesn't have too many relationships in his life. And it's the beginning of COVID and he's got to stay in. And he has, as I have, uh, an antique journal that was in his mother's estate. And this is true. I have an antique journal that was in my mother's estate. It is handwritten from the year 1918. And it turns out, it turns out that it is the diary of a British soldier during World War II who was assigned of all places to the Middle East. Now, I don't know about you, but I was never taught that World War II had anything to do with the Middle East, yeah. much less. Are you talking about World War II or World War One? No, I'm talking about World War One. Did I say World War II? Yeah, you, you've been saying World War Two, and you said 1918. So no, no, I for, think we have to be World War I. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Uh, you you yes. got a gold star on that one for thank you. Yeah. you thank can, you. You I'm can skip the listener. pop quiz this week. I'm a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, yes, World War One, and I had no idea that that the British Army was anywhere near the Middle East in World War One, much less that their that their troop assignments extended all the way over to India. And it turns out that the British were not only concerned that the Germans were going to go build a railroad to Baghdad and bypass their beloved Suez Canal. But they also were afraid that the Russians were going to come down through Afghanistan and establish a beachhead on the Indian Ocean. So that they, you know, the my seventh grade history teacher always said, remember, Russia covets warm water ports. And that actually totally explains what our good friend Mr. Putin is doing uh, these days because Sebastopol, which is hit one of his largest submarine nuclear submarine bases, is in the Crimea, at the tip of the Crimea, in the Black Sea. And also, where is our good friend Mr. Putin's uh, palatial home? On the Black Sea. <laughs> you know, it is a, it, that is their access to the Mediterranean and the Suez Canal and the, you know, the, uh, the Gulf of of Basra and and uh, all that the Indian Ocean the uh, the uh, access to sea access to India the Far East and as Gerald I have to I have to unfortunately um, we have to cut there and give out your website because I'm running out of time oh here my, I've my. already gone over so oh. much time <laughs> just having such a great conversation but let me give out your website. Um, Gerald Everett Jones.com. The name of this book is Preacher Raises the Dead. You heard he's got a new book in the works, which we'll have to just kind of wait and see what happens <laughs> <laughs> since I, I'm not letting him tell anymore. But Gerald, thank you so much for coming on Star Style, Be the Star You Are, uh, and best of success with, uh, with this preacher. And I'm sure you'll probably have another another one in the works for this as well. There's a free book on the website. I do appreciate your mentioning it. That'll get them started in the series. And you can find Gerald also on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, Get Published. We never even talked about Get Published Radio. So in any case, go getpublishedradio.com. Well, thank you, Gerald, for being on Star Style. Uh, you've been listening to Cynthia Bryan. This is Star Style, Be the Star You Are. Gerald's book again, Preacher Raises the Dead. Be the star you are. The star you